All right, we are in Custer, South Dakota at the Buffalo Roundup, and we have the pleasure of speaking with Governor Christy Nome. Thank you so much for having us. It's been beautiful getting to visit your state and see what you guys have to offer and just coming out of that wonderful ride that we just did. Well, we're so glad you're here. This is a big event in South Dakota. We're very proud of it. And uh, we usually have about 20,000 people here. I'm sure that's what we have, if not a little bit more. Uh, they get to see really the best day in South Dakota. Um, I love it. It's great to have so many visitors, and I'm glad we had good weather too. Yeah, it's been incredible. It's my first time here. I love the outdoor so I was just like, this oh, is so amazing yeah. and really cool. And I think that's why we see a lot of people talking about South Dakota, and I see in our market in the D.C. area, your ads coming up for coming oh, to travel to South Dakota. It's been all over the place, and it's really nice to see that. So now we get to see it first. Yeah, you're in Custer State Park, which is a beautiful state park, and Mount Rushmore's, you know, yeah, 15, we got 20 to minutes. Did you? Good. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So really, you know, South Dakota is a small state, and a lot of times people didn't really know what we had to offer. So I'm just glad you came that you can showcase our beauty and our people. I think yeah. it's really special here. And for years I've said I believe South Dakota can be an example to the nation. And that's really what this last six months and year has offered us the opportunity to be. Wonderful. Why don't we start with your background? Because everyone knows you worked in politics for a long time, but I want to ask a little bit differently uh, of you a question because I've known about your background for a little bit working in politics, but you're also an avid outdoorsman, you're a conservationist, uh, grew up on a ranch, cattling, all that type of stuff. But why don't you talk about your background for people who sure. don't know already? Sure. So I was, grew up on a farm with my family uh, from the time I was real little. All I wanted to do was grow up and farm and ranch with my dad. He was a cowboy um, and he was tough. So I was outside with him all the time. Um, our life changed quite a bit when he passed away when I was in college and that's really when I took over the operation with my family. and. And we farmed together for decades and ranched and raised cattle. But being outdoors, you know, my grandma was a big bird hunter. She loved it. Her name was Grandma Doris. And uh, so I learned that love for being outdoors and duck hunting, pheasant hunting. But it was really my dad that taught me game hunting, too, big game, uh, elk hunting, some deer. So it's just been a part of our life. I think every family vacation was a trip doing something outdoors for hunting and enjoying the wildlife. Which has been your favorite big game to target thus far? Well, I I always love archery elk hunting with my brothers. I haven't gotten to do it for a few years. We've been a little busy, but I, I think it's because of the weather, being outside, being close to the wildlife, but then also spending time with my brothers. That's a time away that we uh, you can't ever really get back. And we're at the point right now where they're starting to bugle in close by, right? Yes. I was told that they're bugling close yeah. by. We're, we're getting into a time where a lot of hunters are taking elk. In fact, here in the Black Hills, we've had several weeks of archery elk hunting already, and then rifle will start later on. <laughs> That's awesome. And you just posted a video to your social media account, which I'm not going to give you flag for because you actually did something really good because we talk about like responsible recreation. I don't know if you've heard that term, but in the conservation kind of movement in outdoor space, we talk about recreating responsibly, and hunting falls in the confines of doing that. I don't know why people were giving you flack for doing that. It was really crazy. Well, they do. Um, you know, and I think people just don't understand our way right. of life, yeah. or, or maybe we're just looking for an opportunity to be critical. So right. uh, the one thing they could be critical of was my shooting. Uh, <laughs> it took me three <laughs> shots to take that bird down. Uh, apparently, I have no pride left that oh. I'll feed that, but that's why I said less COVID, more hunting. I haven't gotten the chance to be outdoors very much lately. Um, I could use some practice. I mean, hey, that was the same for me. I got my first bird ever. My first animal was a pheasant. It was uh -huh. pen race too, and that's nothing wrong uh -huh. to, be, to be targeting pen race pheasants. And you guys actually have some of the best pheasant hunting here in the state. Can you talk a little bit about that, why people should come to South Dakota for we, pheasant hunting? Absolutely. This is the best place in the world, and people have known it for decades to come and enjoy pheasant hunting. I say it's the only state that actively celebrates shooting at state bird. Um, mm -hmm. And it, uh, but for us, it's time together. You know, pheasant hunting is a social day. You're out with people talking, walking the fields, looking at the stewardship that farmers and ranchers have on their land and really understanding uh, the habitat that it provides for our wildlife. Um, so management is incredibly important and you won't see people who love their land uh, more than the people of South Dakota. In fact, I distinctly remember growing up my dad always talking about you, you don't sell land, Christy. Uh, God isn't making any more land. And for him, it was taking care of it so it would be around for his grandkids and great grandkids. And that's really the heart of the people here. Right. And that's the principle of conservation and not preservation. Right. Because yeah, I absolutely. think the people, people get those two concepts confused. And then, I mean, we'll talk more about the political angle of that. But people think that if you're hunting or if you're using the land for many different uses, you're not conserving, you're just destroying or you're doing this. And I think people have a 
a terrible understanding of that kind of stewardship model. And what have you done in terms of promoting stewardship so far in your tenure as governor? Well, a couple of things. So you're in the Black Hills, and when I was in Congress, we got um, some processes fixed in the Black Hills to allow us to maintain our forests. I think we're seeing the results with these wildfires in many other states of people not taking care of and maintaining their forests. We do that here in the Black Hills, and I think we've got the most beautiful landscape of anywhere in the world because we've done exactly what we needed to do and conserve that, that area. As governor, I started a statewide habitat program that allowed landowners to participate in a program to put their margin land, so their land that would be too wet, maybe have high salinity in it, uh, into habitat grass that would help the wildlife, but also specific um, you know, varieties of grass that would rebuild their soil, um, give it more nitrogen, give it more um, nutrients so that it could sustain crops into the future. So it was a win-win a program for our state and it gave those landowners the opportunity to take that marginal acres out of production and really help our wildlife and our habitat as well. And being obviously a conservative Republican, people do not think of people in the movement as being conservationists. Can you dispel that notion? Should, well, should we try to be more like that? Yeah, I think it's silly, and I think that maybe us as conservatives just need to talk about it more. Because we're doing it every day, we just don't tell our story very well. Um, we have um, incredible opportunities to showcase that. A lot of the states that are the most beautiful, that you look across the landscape and see work being done to stop erosion, to stop wind damage, to help make sure that we're protecting our wildlife and outdoor way of life. Um, is in Republican states. So, uh, you know, maybe we're just not uh, being effective enough in talking about it and educating people about all the good work that's getting done. Mm -hmm. That's very true. And I want to kind of switch it over to politics a little sure. bit. You've probably been following the Supreme Court nomination. Yes, I have. And it's really cool. I know you being very empowered as a conservative huh? woman, you're probably excited to see a originalist, te con uh, textualist uh, woman be selected. Uh -huh. What are your thoughts on that? And do you think you're gonna we're going to see that nominee cross the threshold? Well, certainly. I think I think we should. We should follow precedent. And we have always followed this process. This should be no different. Mm -hmm. um, many, many times before, in an election year, the president has made their choice and they've been put into position. So, you know, I think that's what needs to be clear to everyone is that this administration is following exactly the same process that's been followed for generations. And what advice do you have, since you have a few minutes left, uh, do you have for women who are interested in running for office? Because I know you've probably been pummeled with questions about your future, but I, I figured you're living out this great lifestyle. Yeah. You're a governor. People are paying attention to you. You have risen your profile a lot. Right. What, have you, what advice do you have for women out there, especially Republican or conservative women, who want to possibly cross the threshold, run for office, run for governor, run for Congress? What are your thought, thoughts on that? Do you want to see more of that? I would tell them to say yes. You know, try it. You don't necessarily have to do it forever. But we need a diversity of voices at the table when we're debating policy. Um, when you have different people and different perspectives around the table, you'll get better policy in place, better laws in place that work for families, that work for businesses, and really make sure that we're preserving what's great about America. So, you know, that's, I think, what's scary for women a lot of times is they're already doing a lot of things. But just say yes and try it. Make a decision, I'll try it for a year. Try it for two years, one term, and that doesn't mean you have to do it forever if it doesn't work. But you may find that you've got gifts and talents that you didn't know that you had, and uh, that you're actually good at something and speaking for people that otherwise, otherwise um, wouldn't have their voices be heard. And what's the final pitch for people who are curious about South Dakota, haven't visited yet, but what would you say to them? Oh, just come. It's beautiful, but what's beautiful about South Dakota is our people. Um, you know, they, they're incredible. They work hard, they love their families, and uh, they really are the best of America.